Okay, we are live streaming. You can go ahead and start the meeting, Donna. Okay, will do. Thank you, Emily. Welcome, everyone. Uh, nice to see you. Um, all right, it is 4.05 p.m. We'll call the um, <clears throat> meeting to order. And um, it's my honor to acknowledge uh, with respect that we are in Robinson Huron Treaty Territory, uh, that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and known as Bawating. And Bawating is home of the Garden River First Nation, the Batchewana First Nation, and the historic Sault Ste. Marie Metis Council. Um, the next item on our agenda is uh, adoption of the minutes of our last meeting, which was on June 9th. Could I have someone to move and someone to second adoption of those minutes, please? Uh, thank you, Jamie, and thank you, Mark. Any uh, questions, concerns, additions, deletions to those? Um, okay, and seeing uh, no changes, all in favor, and uh, those uh, minutes are um, approved. That would be everyone. Okay, thank you, thank you, Fred. I was just about to say, Fred, if you and yeah, you, you were right there, right there. Okay. Anyone with a pecuniary interest declaration for today? Anyone with a conflict on any of the items on our agenda? Seeing none, we will move on to adoption of the agenda. May I have a move and move? <laughs> ooh, a mover and a seconder. Uh, for adoption of uh, today's agenda. Looking, thank you, uh, Pedro. Thank you, Jamie. Um, any additions, deletions, uh, or changes to today's agenda? And seeing none, uh, all in favor of approval of today's agenda, that is carried. Thank you very much. All right, moving on. I believe this is item, whoops, hold on. Six. And we have a presentation. Um, welcome Christy Sayers, who's the Energy Advisor at the Garden River First Nation. Um, and she's going to share with us some information on um, their work on environmental sustainability. Um, between Emily and Christy, please uh, take it away. Well, thanks for the introduction, Donna, and welcome Christy. We're thrilled to have you here. Um, you should be able to go ahead and share your screen. Um, Donna gave you a good introduction, but if there's anything else you'd like to add, feel free to do so. Thanks for joining us today. Yes, thank you for having me. Um, oh, it's showing the wrong screen, I think, is it? Uh, we can see it as in like if, as if it were in PowerPoint. So if you want to click slideshow and uh, oh, it's in the um, it's in the the note version. We can see your notes. Okay. It always ends up doing this to me. <laughs> Sorry. One of these days, eh? <laughs> okay. I think if you right click, actually, Christy, um, and you go to hide presenter view, and then click from beginning, beginning again, should work. I can see it just fine. I can see if it's it's just fine if it's any consolation. Okay. It's showing up on my other screen, just not on my main screen. But anyways, so we can see it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my name is Christy Sayers. I'm from Garden River First Nation. Um, I'm just going to present our um, our Indigenous Community Energy Plan, and there's kind of the projects that we're kind of working on right now in Garden River. Uh, right now, I'm just going to kind of give a quick little. Uh, intro. So we'll be doing, I'll be discussing the Indigenous Community Energy Plan. Uh, I'm the Energy Advisor with Garden River, and um, I'll discuss like our upcoming projects and then some of the programs that are available, not just to Garden River, but to everyone. Uh, so right now with the Indigenous Community Energy Plan, 
Uh, the purpose and goal of the ISEP is to implement our current and future energy priorities, promote educational development and awareness programs while engaging in the community and leadership. Uh, I work with a lot of other departments here in Garden River, such as public works, waste management, education, housing and lands and resources. And we hope to build awareness, become further educated on our true cost of energy, uh, including the impact of the environment and, econo and economy. Uh, with the Indigenous Community Energy Plan with Garden River, we began working on it uh, back in 2014. Uh, in 2017, Garden River applied for funding through the IESO to create a very successful Indigenous Community Energy Plan. Chief and Council were provided information on the ISEP, and we had uh, WSP Global complete a waste management study to provide the next steps in the energy conservation back in 2018. In 2019, Garn River hired an energy advisor to expand the community energy file by promoting energy awareness through programs, webinars, rebates, community engagements, and updating the current ISEP. In 2021, the Garden River First Nation ISEP was updated with funding received from the IESO's Indigenous Community Energy Plan Program. And as the energy advisor, I'm responsible for implementing the development of the ISEP providing support services, uh, program assistance, and coordinating special projects related to the community energy plan, and uh, build capacity in the engagement and training area to further development and sustain overall capacity for Garden River relating to green and renewable energy. Uh, right now, what we're working on is, um, so we're getting solar uh, put on at Ojibwe Park. Um, the Ojibwe Park experiences a large jump in energy uh, usage during summer months due to the nature of it being a uh, tent and trailer park. It's the third highest energy consumer in Garden River, but it only operates uh, seasonally. Ojibwe Park is the last banned old building to receive solar PV panels due to previous costs and upgrades needed to the park's facilities. So we have about 12 buildings right now that uh, all have uh, solar PV on them, except for Ojibwe Park which is obviously in the process right now. Uh, funding has been approved uh, back in 2021 to complete a feasibility study and energy audit, along with a scope of work to design, procure, install, and monitor solar technology. And the completion of this project should be completed by next year, next summer. Uh, we have a waste transfer station, and uh, we had a waste management plan that was developed to reduce waste production within our community. And then a transfer station was implemented to manage uh, items not uh, accepted via curbside collection, along with the community share shed in our recycling center, which all these stations together make it easier for residents to sort and organize appropriately when it's all in one location versus it going to a couple few different stations. And uh, we're just right now in the midst of finalizing. It's going to go to chief and council to finalize the permanent location because right now we just have kind of a, it's just kind of in an area right now, it's not in the best location, but we need that permanent location to make sure it runs properly. And then we're in the midst of completing um, new street lighting for Garden River. We're just uh, starting an application for it actually for through the IES. So they have a new program that just came out that's called the First Nation Community Building Retrofit Program. And with this one, you can pick up to like 20 buildings to get like energy audits completed. Um, there's like three different areas you can kind of pick from, and we chose the street lighting option because right now we're in need of not only upgrades to our street lighting for LED lights, but to have all of them working in proper order because right now there's quite a few lights that are out on our streets that we do get complaints from the community members on. So this is one of our top priorities right now to get completed. And then we've also had completed other projects such as like the small business lighting programs. We've done that on all of our businesses here, which was um, a good upgrade to all the fixtures and bulbs in the buildings. Um, we have, yeah, lots of, uh, lots of items on the go right now and just think that we've completed in the last uh, at least three years. And then the programs that are available, we deal with the Ontario Electricity Support Program. Every single person that I get into Garden River, I try and sign them up for this program. It gives them a credit on their uh, Ogoma power bill. So usually it's anywhere between like $68 and up, and it's mainly for low income families. But being on reserve, we do qualify because we are considered a zero income. Uh, energy affordability and winterization program. 
uh, with this pro with these two, these are two actually two separate programs, but they basically go hand in hand, and it'll be the same uh, energy energy auditor that comes in and does all the assessments. Um, so usually, if he can do both at the same time, he will. And these programs um, are great for they come into your home, they do upgrades to your fridge, your deep freezer, um, your insulation in your attic, just anything that'll help reduce the cost for energy. Uh, low income energy assistance program, the LEAP program, if you're behind on your electricity or natural gas bill, uh, and you're in this, like looking at getting a uh, service disconnected, you may qualify for emergency financial help. So they pay up to about $1,000 uh, total for if you want to split up between two bills, uh, either your electricity bill or your natural gas bill, um, or you can put it all towards one if you wanted to, if you were that behind on your uh, payments. And then the small business lighting program, uh, the Save on Energy small business program is designed to help small businesses across Ontario and make equipment improvements to reduce the energy consumption at no cost. So they come in, basically give you your, um, basically an energy audit um, on all the buildings and they kind of look at your lighting. They look at your, uh, see if you need to get upgrades, not just bulbs changed, but like actual upgrades on your fixtures, that type of thing. And then, um, yeah, no, it's a really good program. And majority of our buildings in Garden River that did do that program uh, all did the upgrades, but the extra cost that you have to do. So it was really good to know that uh, Garden River was willing to cover all those uh, extra upgrades to help improve energy costs. And that's about it. That's all I have for right now. So if anyone has any questions for me, you can contact me at ksayers at gardenriver.org. Uh, it's probably the best way to get a hold of me is through my email, or you can call me at the office in my extensions 241 here in Garden River. Thank you, Christy. Wow, there's a lot going on. Absolutely. <laughs> Woo. Um, uh, anyone with questions um, or anything you'd like to share with Christy? I'd like to just jump in quickly, if I may. Sure. Um, Christy, uh, for those who may not be that familiar with the Indigenous Community Energy Plan, is it available online? And also, um, could you speak maybe to some of the more uh, legacy or older solar projects? Just how many band buildings actually have uh, solar on them, just offhand, if you happen to know? Yeah, so there are 10 band owned buildings that do have uh, solar panels on them right now. So those buildings would be like our recreation center, our bingo hall the community center, the wellness center, the administration building, our Dan Pine Healing Lodge. Um, I'm missing four. <laughs> Sorry, just trying to go off the top of my head. But majority of our band owned buildings have the have the solar on them. And it was a big project to complete. One building was the rec center building. It was kind of done separately, but then the rest of it was done towards our IESO uh, microfit programs that was available. That's no longer available anymore, but it was a really good program and we took full advantage of it. <laughs> Glad that you guys did. No, that's awesome. And is there anywhere else, if anyone wanted to see um, online, maybe at Garden River to view the Indigenous Community Energy Plan, is it available electronically? Yeah, you can actually go right on to if you're, anyone's on Facebook, you can go onto our website there too. Um, on our Facebook page, you can either actually it's right on the Garden River First Nation page, and we have our own website as well through um, Garden River uh, ERCD, which awesome. is the Economic Resource and Community Development. Super. Thanks, Emily. Go ahead, Jamie. Hi, Christy. Thanks for the presentation. I have a couple of questions regarding like usage stats or results from these programs being implemented. Like how's the uptake been particularly on the home energy um, audits and, and updates? And what have you seen in terms of results from that for energy efficiencies? Right now, we've actually seen quite a bit of updates. Usually it's been about, about a three to 4% uh, change in our um, electricity bills it's been huge for salt with the solar on them actually right now not just through the programs but with um through residentials with the programs mainly residential people have gotten some major uh a lot of them are in a credit right now with their Oklahoma power bills and stuff by using the OESP program which is really good but with the businesses themselves um I find majority of our bills in the summertime are in the credit and during the winter time I think we come just close to maybe paying like $5 on a bill at one point. And so that the credit from it really does pay off in the end for 
having solar on the buildings because it really does cover those costs and it saves us money. So it's it's worth it. Okay, awesome. That sounds good. Um, anyone else with questions for Christy? Okay, seeing none. Hey, Christy, thanks. Nice to meet you today and thanks for sharing with us. It's great to see what uh, what you're doing in Garden River. We, you know, it's uh, we're all we all we're all in this together, right? So yeah. we all have to do our we have to do our part. So um, um, awesome. Thanks for your time today. Much appreciated. Yes, thank you very much. Thanks for listening, everyone. Take care, dear. Okay. So next, I believe uh, we are moving on to our green initiatives programs review and we have several here and Emily I'm gonna um uh if sorry I'm jumping around on screens here if you could just take us through these one one at a time that would be super I'll let you take over here now or I'd appreciate it I should say if you would take over and we'll go through I think it's three right yeah we have um we have three of them our our first application uh is clean north um but I don't I don't actually see uh, their representative um, in the wings here. So I have reached out to them. Um, okay. So maybe I'll start with uh, the Innovation Center and uh, we'll see if they uh, if they jump in. Um, so yes, we do have uh, three projects that came in for approval to the Green Initiatives Fund. Um, so we'll start with uh, the, uh, the Innovation Center or SMIC. Um, their Rural Agricultural Innovation Network um, submitted an application and we're joined today by Lauren Morin, uh, who works there, who will be happy to speak to this application in more detail. Um, essentially, they have applied to the fund uh, for funding to um, investigate the effectiveness of an organic hydroponic uh, nutrient uh, uh, system that will allow for uh, vermicompost tea. Uh, commonly used uh, inorganic fertilizer uh, to help grow lettuce um, at a site at Harvest Algoma. And in order to complement the research, they're also going to be creating a uh, recorded uh, video, like a how-to video, if you are, if you will, workshop, so that other people can learn about this hydroponic farming um, and the and the benefits associated to it. Uh, so this does hit up several pillars of the Green Initiatives Fund. Um, the system itself uh, will uh, you be closed in nature, meaning that the nutrients and water used to grow the plants are actually captured captured and recycled in the system. So there will be lesser risks of uh, polluting local water sources by fertilizers. And also um, it is actually more of an, a water conservation uh, way of growing the crops as opposed to traditional farming. Um, and uh, yeah, it also helps reduce emissions and it also aligns with our resilient and ecosystem healthy ecosystems and even waste reduction pillars of the Green Initiatives Fund. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Lauren. Lauren, if there's anything else you'd like to add about the scope of the project, please do so. Um, yes, I will also speak to um, the Living Labs network as well, because um, we reached out to them around the knowledge mobilization piece on this research project. So. Um, with that, as well as what we'd be receiving through the Green Initiatives Fund, we'd be able to um, put on not only a recorded virtual workshop that'll be available in like video format online, um, but also we'll be able to do an in-person workshop where we invite folks from the community or outside of the community to come to the site on at Harvest Algoma and to um, essentially learn from a hydroponics expert around um, the different configurations that you can use for hydroponics, the different crops you can grow with it, um, the types of uh, equipment that you might need, and any type of um, like intimate knowledge that you would need to start these types of systems if you were interested in doing it yourself. Um, so yeah, as well as the research piece around the uh, organic nutrient solution and the vermicompost, it'll also um, definitely tap into that knowledge sharing uh, piece as well. Um, so yeah, we're happy to have the Living Labs Network on board with that as well. So um, yeah, not only are we gonna be doing the research on site and then Harvest Algoma will also have this equipment after the fact if they you know, wanna either expand or just continue to use the setup that we've provided through the funding. Um, so that'll help in turn to increase their capacity to grow not just over like the course of the summer months, but they would also be able to use it throughout like the late fall, early winter as well. 
Um, so yeah, really it's all about growing their capacity to have this produce grown almost year round, as well as have an opportunity for folks who are looking into this sustainable growing technology to um, get a hands-on experience with it and then be able to build their own capacity that way. And if anybody has any questions about it, I would be happy to answer them. Yes, anyone with questions for Lauren? Okay. Oh, go ahead, Mark. I was trying to find the unmute, unmute button here. Um, just wanted to ask a few or one or two questions about it. Uh, what is the timeline you're looking at? So if you get the funding and then you, are you going to start this and it's going to be, um, you know, develop all this stuff in a one year cycle and then, you know, what happens afterwards, I guess. Um, yeah, for sure. So um, for the research part, project portion of this, it would uh, take place over the course of um, so the month of September and October um, because uh, the type of crop we would be experimenting on is lettuce and thankfully they're a cooler season crop. So um, that research portion would be taking course over the late summer, early fall months. Um, and once I've done the research portion, um, then that equipment will stay on site for Harvest Algoma and um, they'll be able to train their own employees and volunteers as well on how to operate these systems so that they can, and they could even be adapted because of the configuration that we've chosen for the setup. They can choose to adapt it to grow other crops as well. So instead of leafy greens, they could choose to grow something like tomatoes or experiment with cucumbers. Um, so it wouldn't just be the research around the nutrient solution piece, but they would also be able to, you know, um, train their own employees and volunteers and continue to use that equipment going forward. I'd like to suggest peppers since mine never grow. <laughs> That's a good suggestion, actually. Yes, but, you know, just thought I'd ask. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate it. Uh, anyone else with any questions uh, for Lauren? So I'm not seeing any. Oh, go ahead, Pedro. I, I have a quick question. Thanks. So um, you're requesting around $7,000 um, for the project. Um, could you provide just like a general breakdown, like of the, of of how the, of 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 how it will be utilized? I mean, you have I know you have a videographer, and and then you need the infrastructure as well, and and also so comment on that, and then also the outreach. How how will you is is are people coming to see it? Are they going to benefit from the produce? And how I mean, I'm trying to understand all of that. Yeah, so absolutely. So, yep, included in the budget is an honorarium for the hydroponics expert to come in and do um, not only the in-person workshop, but he would be the one who is in the video tutorial as well that is filmed with the videographer. Um, so there would be those two separate occasions. And um, so for the in-person workshop, that would be an opportunity for folks to join in person. Um, or also if we're going to do like a hybrid model where folks can also tune in like live online if they're not able to come in from out of town. Um, and so yeah, we in, in the budget as well is included things for the workshops, such as like refreshments for the folks who are going to be attending. Um, and uh, so yeah, so a majority of the budget would be towards the infrastructure um, because the initial capital costs of setting up a hydroponic system, um, like that is the major investment when it comes to a project like this. Um, and eventually when you take care of this equipment over time, then, um, you know, eventually you are getting a return on that um, once you've been using it for a couple of years, um, if that's what Harvest Algoma chooses to do. Um, so yeah, that is a majority of the budget is the infrastructure and uh, yeah, just making sure that we're paying the folks for the services that they would be helping to provide for this project. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions? Yeah. So Lauren, you mentioned uh, sort of a arm's length partnership with Harvest Algoma. I think when we look at making investments into some sort of infrastructure like this, we would hope that it's used long term. Has there been any discussions with Harvest Algoma, maybe perhaps even partnering on this application to have some certainty for the committee members approving these types of funds that we will continue as a community to have these benefits that you've identified for more than just one growing season. 
Yeah, absolutely. So Carson Beauregard, he is uh, currently working at Harvest Algoma and Darren Barlow is the project coordinator and I've been in conversation with them about this project since um, the Green Initiatives Fund. Well, actually before the Green Initiatives Fund when we first learned about this Living Labs mini grant that was a couple of months back and since then we've been in conversation around it and uh, Carson is more than happy to use it as a learning opportunity for the folks at Harvest to learn how to operate this uh, this setup and I've you know also highlighted the fact that it's can be used outside of just leafy greens and they can adapt it to whichever crops it is that they're hoping to grow. Um, so yeah, once the setup is in place, as long as it's well looked after, then it can continue until um, like, there's a couple of electronic parts like pumps and stuff like that, that may degrade over time. But as, as long as everything is taken care of properly, then it could last years in operation. It sounds like that Harvest Algoma has agreed to continue utilizing this system. Yeah, yes. So I've I've had conversations with Carson about it, and he's happy to use it as a training opportunity to expand their capacity as well, so that they'll be able to continue to use this after the initial research portion has been completed. Okay, thanks. No problem. I think that brings up an interesting question, actually, Jamie, what you were asking about. Um, and I, uh, forgive me, I read the report or the, the application on this um, a couple, a week or so ago now. So I, I, I may be forgetting something, but Lauren, um, speaking to what Jamie's talking about, contractually in your partnership with Harvest Algoma, is there, is it written um, that, you know, the expectation is that, that this would be carried on um, in multiple, you know, multiple seasons or, or, you know, so it's, 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 it's more than a hope. Like it, it's very clear that, 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 that's the expectation. Yeah, that was, that was included in the application. And, uh, yeah, I've been, we've, we've been communicating back and forth since this whole, the inception of this idea. So, um, yeah, they are, they're more than willing to continue on with it and even potentially expand if they find that it's something that they're getting a good return on their investment for, or, you know, <laughs> Green initiative fund investment. Yeah, yeah, and and that's that's documented in writing. So like, there's an accountability on on both sides. That's awesome. Great. Okay. Any other questions for anyone? I just have a quick follow up question. For this amount of investment, how many lettuces can you produce? Um, so how many people can you provide lettuces with uh, using the system on a given week, for example? Um. So, uh, it's. Depending on the size of the setup, I believe I can just take a look. Well, I'm looking at the budget here. Sorry, it's been a while since I wrote up the spreadsheet. I think it's a request for six, either six or four tables. And in each of those, um, 16 heads of lettuce is able to be grown in a three by three space. Um, and because of the nature of hydroponics, the plants are actually able to grow more quickly. Um, so when we're looking at like bigger setups that I don't have the exact number in front of me or in my head, um, but they are able to harvest um, two to three times more frequently than conventionally grown lettuce. That's just in the ground outdoors per se. Um, so it, it is actually a, a quicker process from germination to having a full head of lettuce compared to um, what you would get just growing it in the ground. Okay, thank you. No problem. Uh, any further questions? Okay, seeing none. So um, could we, uh, uh, is there anyone who would care to move and to second, um, uh, and I'll read the resolution, uh, resolve that the Environmental Sustainability Committee supports the request for funding from the community, oops, the CDF Green Initiative stream in the amount of $7,381.08 for the Sault Ste. Marie Innovation Center Rural Agra Innovation Network hydroponics installation and research project at Harvest Algoma with accompanying workshop and recommends that council approve this request. So could I see, Fred is moving, it would anyone uh, second? All right, thank you, Mark. Um, any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lauren. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Okay. What's next, Em? Okay. So next, we're just going to move uh, to Ben here, Ben Eaton for the City of Sault Ste. Marie um, Greco Pool LED Lighting Project. 
Uh, so thanks, Ben, for joining us today. Uh, so just a quick recap on this. This is an energy efficiency uh, LED lighting conversion project that is taking place at the VE Greco pool uh, here at the city. Um, we have applied to the uh, kind of <laughs> serendipitous, if you will, of uh, Christy talking about the small business lighting program. We are working through the provincial small business lighting program to upgrade uh, the, the lighting at the Greco pool to LED, um, but it only covers a portion of the project. And we've also maxed out uh, maintenance budgets for this uh, initiative as well. So due to the uh, nature of the lighting and the ceiling design at the facility, uh, we need to purchase uh, kits to allow for the fixtures to be uh, installed properly for the LED lighting fixtures rather to be installed at the facility. Um, so the additional monies for that is what is being requested for this project. Uh, as I said, this is uh, an LED lighting project. It has the opportunity to reduce um, the energy consumption of the facility by about 7,000 kilowatt hours um, and result in around $900 in annual energy savings. Um, this aligns with the community greenhouse gas emissions reduction plan, specifically as it results in the uh, uh, the implementation of energy efficiency retrofits and integrating energy technology that is sustainable. And it also aligns with our energy conservation and demand management plan um, that we are mandated to produce by the province. Um, so again, this, this project aligns with the green initiatives uh, program fund pillar of energy efficiency. Uh, ben, not sure if there's anything you want to add. I think I covered most of it there, but we're both here to, to answer questions if need be. No, I think that was most of it, yeah. Okay, uh, anyone with questions for Emily or Ben on this project? Seeing none, oh, go ahead, Mark. Yep, so I guess I'll go first, or if I'm the only one that's gonna, just a couple questions. So if this doesn't happen this year, will it? Uh, would it be possible to come out of next year's uh, maintenance budget? I assume, Ben, you can maybe speak to that, like you get an annual maintenance budget for all of the facilities. I know our facility manager, uh, Jason, could probably speak to that in a little bit more detail, um, but it's my understanding uh, in conversation with uh, Virginia, uh, who is the manager of recreation and culture, that monies that have been allocated to that budget for this year for other facilities, it's not just the Greco pool, um, have been maxed out. Uh, so there is a maintenance budget uh, that is available, um, I suppose, hypothetically, yep. Yeah, In the following well, we, year. We do have a maintenance budget, um, but we've been pretty tight with it. We also put in two brand new sand filters that had to come out of our capital budget into that facility. And next year we're looking at putting in uh, heating units as well for the outdoor pools, which is coming out of the capital. So it's not uh, the but the maintenance budget is pretty pretty slim there. Anything that major projects or whatever has to be approved by the capital. What further to Mark's question, um, Ben? What's the timeline on making this happen? Like, is this going to happen in this year? Or so I'll just I'll jump in if I can, Ben. Um, so we we had we underwent an assessment of the facility uh, earlier this year, and uh, we we were we were good to go. We allocated additional monies from the maintenance budget for the installation of the retrofit. But when it actually came to when the contractors came there, um, that's when they noticed uh, the ceiling design uh, situation and it upped the cost to require those retro retrofit kits to allow for the installation of the fixtures. So we were hoping to get this completed this year. Like I said, it has an opportunity to reduce our energy costs by about $900 a year. So the return on investment is pretty decent, um, but it can be put off hypothetically. Provincial programs do have a tendency to change. I haven't been made aware of any changes to the small business lighting program, but we are relying on that for a portion of the budget for this project as well. So that's something else to keep in mind that it was approved for this year. I don't know exactly what the timeline is. I'd have to look into it for how long those assessments can stand for. How much money is coming out of the small business lighting program, Emily, for this project? Um, 
bear with me. I'm just going to pull open the work order here. $3,315.42. I'm sorry, could you say that again? $3,300. Okay. Mark, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say the, uh, the S this SPL, the Small Business Lighting Program, isn't it? It's up for renewal this year, at the end of this year. So it'll be, you know, mid to end of next year before they get somebody new in place. And yeah, so next year is probably a wash in terms of, just from what I'm aware of the provincial programs that are out there, that it's all under renewal, I believe it's at the end of this year. So uh, from my understanding. Thanks, Mark. Any other questions from anyone on this project? Go ahead, Andre. Um, I, I'm not questioning the value of the project, but uh, maybe Donna, you can uh, answer this. Um, uh, if you look at the bigger picture, all this money is coming from the city. The city gave the Environmental Sustainability Committee some funds to help community apply to it. But I, I find it funny that the city is applying for its own money from a pocket that they put money into as opposed to another pocket. It's just, I don't know if that's what our committee is to do. I thought maybe the money that we were given, I mean, I'm, not, I'm just trying to figure out not the purpose of the project, but how this money thing is and why I, because it's like we have this money as a committee to help worthwhile project. This project is worthwhile, but it's actually the city's money. We're giving back to the city kind of, you know what I mean? It's a, that's my question or comment. Yeah. Um, the, my answer to that, Andre, at this moment would be that's the system. Um, and um, that, that's the I can speak. I can add Thank to it, Donna. Go ahead. Thank so, you. So the Green Initiatives Fund is open to local nonprofit organizations as well as city departments. And both of those entity types are eligible for all six different pillars of funding, which includes energy efficiency projects. So in the event that you have a project that is energy efficiency related, for example, like the one that we're facing right now, should there be resource constraints from an internal standpoint, this is a pot of funding that municipal departments can go after. That is the way the terms of reference are designed. Uh, uh, can I just, just a quick comment? It's, um, I think, um, how can I, if, if we have, the city should, could, potentially every department in the city could potentially then um, say, well, we, we could improve this and that. And then that money that we have could easily depleted for, um, so I, I'm saying the city should put aside a certain amount of money to cover this outside of the money that we got. That's odd because I can see that if we open that door, then everybody else can come on. That's, that's just, my thought and I, I i don't that's i just like to think that's kind of a weird way of doing things so anyways thanks for the feedback andre uh, uh any other questions um seeing none uh, where is anybody uh will anyone move our, and then second um this um Resolution resolved that the Environmental Sustainability Committee supports the request for funding from the Green Initiative stream in the amount of $2,938 for the City of Sault Ste. Marie's Greco Pool LED lighting upgrade project and recommends that Council approve the request. So I'm not seeing anyone prepared to... Okay, sorry, thank you. Uh, Jamie um, and Mark. Um, and so um, all in favor of the resolution. All right, that's carried. Thank you, Ben. Thank you very oh, much. Okay, um, um, Emily, I assume we can. Um, 
we're able, so Clean North is our next application. Right. Um, we are able to uh, move forward without the applicant uh, being right. here. Right. Um, I have worked closely with them on the application, so I'm happy to speak to it. Okay. Okay, go ahead. All right. So um, our final application for review this evening is the Clean North uh, Soil um, and RX Bottle project funding request. Essentially, they've come in with two projects under one application. Um, however, they all they do align um, very much with uh, contributing to um, you know reducing waste as well as regreening initiatives within the community. Um, so the RX Bottle subproject is part of a multi-city collaborative effort to divert clean prescription bottles with lids from landfills for reuse in international disaster relief. Uh, clean North has collaborated with Earth Hub, which is a volunteer organization focused on spreading sustainable awareness, keeping items out of the landfill for reuse and partnering with other environmental groups across Canada to make a difference on our planet. Um, so the second subproject will support Clean North's uh, extensive community garden initiatives. Uh, just for some background, last year Clean North was directly um, was I'll answer that in one second, Jam Jamie. Um, Clean North was directly responsible for four community garden sites across the city. Um, including Emmanuel's Community Garden, Etienne Brude Community Garden, St. Mary's College School Garden, um, and the Steelworkers number 2251, which in total have 70 garden beds among them. Um, and so these, pro this, these community gardens uh, will this project specifically will focus on purchasing and delivering composted garden soil from a local vendor um, who I believe they've identified in their application as Lemieux uh, to fill new and replenish existing garden beds at several community garden sites in the fall. Um, these gardens help individuals and families to grow their own pesticide-free produce. Uh, they grow and donate produce that supports local food bank programs. Um, engage families, new immigrants, youth and young people, as well as people with physical and cognitive disabilities and gardening, and reduces the fuel use um, and vehicle emissions from trucking produce to Sault Ste. Marie from Southern Ontario. They're using a locally produced garden loam mixed, uh, which is locally made using organic material that they divert from the landfill, which also reduces emissions from transporting soil and plastic bags from outside of the community and also supports a locally owned um, and operated soil composting business. Uh, so both of these sub projects that they're applying for um, align with green initiative fund pillars, including emissions reduction, uh, healthy and resilient ecosystems, um, and waste reduction. And I'll just add in, in addition to uh, the description here on behalf of Clean North, they have a variety of community partners uh, listed in their application. Um, I had mentioned Earth Hub, but for the RX prescription bottle um, uh, project, they are also working with White Pines Life Skills class. They clean the bottles and they prep them for shipment. They also work with Hartera, our local uh, refillery here in the community. And then for the community garden project, uh, they also, as I had mentioned, worked with the different community gardens, as well as the People's Garden at Algoma University. Um, so quite a few community partnerships uh, for this for this initiative. Um, so again, they're looking for assistance financially for the, the RX bottles from shipping and postage standpoint, as well as for the community garden, specifically the purchase of soil, compost soil from Lemieux Composting. Thanks, Emily. Uh, questions, anyone? I see there's a question here uh, from Jamie regarding what is uh, left in the Green Initiatives Fund. Um, so without the projects that are here today, we actually have $71,000 left in the fund. Now I know our budget is 50,000 and I did sort this out with our finance department a, about a couple months ago. There was actually rollover into our fund from the city's previous green committee that was allocated to our budget for this year. So we have, as I said, about $71,000 left in the fund. And, and with that, Emily, can you clarify, um, thank you, Jamie, for bringing that question forward. We did 
Um, forgive me if I'm getting my years confused, but we did have a uh, 13-ish thousand, 15,000 something left from 2021, which went towards tree planting, correct? In this correct. year, is that, that's right? We had 17,000 remaining from 2021 that went towards tree planting on city land this year. And I believe we that purchased approximately 100 to 150 trees. Okay. And so the number that you just mentioned now, that is outside of that. Correct. Okay. Cause that's already been spent and that's removed from the, road. that is uncommitted funding. The number that I was referring to. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Other questions. Seeing none. Do I have, yeah. a go ahead. Just a question comment. Like I kind of wish that uh, clean North was here to, to discuss more of their prescription bottle recycling. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I was just curious if they could speak to any outreach or programs uh, partnering with the pharmacies in town, because I was recently at a pharmacy and asked them to recycle the bottles for me. And they said, no, we just throw them out. We can throw them out for you. And so I thought, well, that's a definitely a missed opportunity. So this outreach program or the poster stamp with people collecting bottles and recycling through them is great. And this can we have even more impact? through some additional outreach with some businesses. So um, yeah, I just wanted to ask them a little bit about that. I can, I can share your comment with them, Jamie, absolutely, sure. just regarding uh, communication. I know that, um, and I can just speak because I, I do work with them quite regularly. Clean North uh, is very active on their social media. They also have a web page with a blog. Now, granted, not everyone is on social media um, or checking out their website on the reg. Um, but as I said, they do work with local um, local stakeholders like Hartera and White Pines on this project. And I think you're absolutely right. There is opportunity to grow it and build awareness. So I'll see if there's a way that maybe the city can help promote this program as well. Uh, we do it for all projects that are successful to the Green Initiatives Fund. And I think we can definitely grow the awareness of this if it's successful, um, just to increase communication about this great initiative. Okay. Um, thanks, Jamie. Any other questions? Um, Emily, I would uh, appreciate if we could put the whole con the whole discussion of um, prescription bottles on another agenda, like, or just, I would love to understand more about, you know, are there communities or, or is there a way in which these bottles can be reused, et cetera, like not today, but, you know, it's certainly a huge source of, of plastic waste. Uh, and um, if there are some innovative things happening out there in the world uh, on that, in terms of how they could be reused, et cetera, that would be cool to know. Um, all right. So uh, someone to move and someone to second. Uh, do we have on this, uh, the Clean North Soil and Prescription Bottle Project funding request? Thank you, Andre, to move. Do I have someone to second? Thank you, Pedro. All right, so um, all in favor? That is carried. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, for one sec while I switch screens here. Next on the agenda, I believe is Jamie. Uh, who's going to um, uh, share with us, uh, she's at our spotlight for August. Thank you, Jamie. Um, take it away. Uh, Jamie's the Senior Manager for Corporate Sustainability and Reporting at PwC. Sorry, I'll have to figure out how to mute and unmute myself when my controls hide, when you're presenting something. So this is new. I, I work off uh, a Google Suites all the time, so I'm not as familiar with this whole Zoom protocol. All right, so it's super big on my screen. I'm gonna put you all on that side and I'm gonna focus on the presentation. All right, so how am I moving forward on my slides? Clicking, there we go. Everything's good to go, Emily. You can hear me okay? You can see, we can see and hear you. Perfectly fine, Jamie. Okay, so about PricewaterhouseCoopers, otherwise known as PwC, 
Uh, you may or may not have heard of PwC, but uh, globally, PwC is a network of independent professional services firms. Um, we have offices in over 156 countries and employ more than, actually, it's more than 300,000 people worldwide now. Um, PwC is among the leading professional services networks in the world, and we help individuals and organizations by delivering quality in assurance, tax, and consulting and deals services. So um, in PwC Canada, our firm has over 8,000 people and 600 partners, and we're in almost all of the major cities all across Canada. Um, for myself, I have the fortune of sitting in Sault Ste. Marie and connecting virtually to my assigned office in Toronto. So a real benefit coming out of COVID, how we reimagined our work at PwC and how we can support uh, the different lifestyles of our people across Canada. So for me, that worked. Uh, in fiscal 21, to give you a sense of how big the organization is, uh, PwC firms globally provided services to about 84% of the global Fortune 500 company, companies, and uh, that resulted in gross revenues exceeding $45 billion US. So a little about me, uh, my education is in environmental sciences and environmental microbiology. I spent uh, 14 years in the energy industry, focused on environmental management across a broad spectrum of disciplines, but I've always been uh, very focused on greenhouse gas emissions and air emissions. Uh, I made the transition to PwC about two years ago as their senior manager of corporate sustainability and reporting. And I report uh, directly to our chief sustainability officer to build out programs and deliver on the firms. Uh, environmental, social, and governance goals. So specifically over this past year, our team spearheaded a new trust roadmap and trust agenda. Uh, we've led the firm's net zero business transformation efforts, and that's aligned to a 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. Um, we continue to address society's digital divide through our new world, new skills commitment. So this is a, a program I'll talk a little bit more about later in the deck. And uh, we're continually um, connecting with our internal stakeholders and our external stakeholders to collect and analyze a suite of ESG data to continually improve our performance as we develop metrics and create values to uh, report back on our progress. So for the rest of this presentation, it's set up this way that you can, we'll dive into a little bit of trust, a little bit of our net zero goal and our new world, new skills commitment. All right, so trust. At uh, PwC Canada, our purpose is to build trust in society and solve important problems. So our reputation is really built on our ability to live our purpose and everything that we do. So from doing our work uh, with the organizations we serve to our broader impacts on society. So we have a long history of doing this through our financial reporting and our compliance work, but we know that building trust goes much further than that as we encompass a more diverse stakeholder landscape and uh, new and evolving drivers of accountability. So this is why we're on a journey ourselves to understand trust and take action to be accountable to living up to our commitments and being transparent about where we fall short. In January of 2022, we introduced our trust roadmap. You can see the links I've put here on the slide where you can view a little bit more about our agenda, our roadmap and our KPI chart. So um, please check those out. So our trust roadmap, the intention of that is really to help ensure that our actions and behaviors match our intentions and our commitments in every interaction and relationship. And I know that every one of you will have a different perspective on what it earns trust. It's personal. Um, but I know that uh, trust is measured by individual and collective thoughts and feelings about our intentions. Kind of hard to measure, right? <laughs> And it's calculated against how well we embody competence, consistency, and integrity in everything we do, especially when things go wrong. So examining our current stakeholder sentiment allowed us to better understand what's important to our people, 
our clients and the general public. And going through this process over the last uh, year and a half or so uh, really revealed how and where we are building, maintaining, or eroding trust in our brand. So I'm just going to play this video that will help explain a little bit more about our, the journey of trust we're on. In this purpose-driven era, building trust is more critical than ever before. But it's not easy. Talent has never been harder to acquire or retain. There is increasing government intervention and organizations face unprecedented downward pressure on expected returns. I know managing through uncertainty with resilience and leading with purpose are key to strengthening connection in this market. An organization that I believe in and that believes in me, that makes all the difference. When you invite more people to the table, you strengthen the community and your bottom line. How will your organization lead the way? Where can you drive impact through purpose? And what can you do to ensure you're constantly improving trust in and within your organization? Trust is critical to building the sustained outcomes that can create value for both your stakeholders and society. It's earned through every interaction, experience, relationship, and outcome delivered. And while it has become harder for organizations to build trust, it's never been easier for that bond to be broken. Here at PwC Canada, trust is at the core of our purpose, connecting us to our people, our clients, and the community. It's the foundation of everything we do. We know that for us to be able to help others build trust, we must be worthy of trust ourselves. So we set out to learn everything we could about the tangible and intangible factors that contribute to trust. We talk to everyone who touches our business to understand why people put their trust in us, and perhaps even more importantly, the ways we fall short. We created a framework that takes everything we heard from our stakeholders and used it to identify what drives trust in our organization. The situations where trust matters most and the metrics we can use to ensure we're living up to our purpose and values. We know trust is constantly changing and evolving. Our trust roadmap has helped us uncover opportunities to continue building trust and focus our efforts to become even more accountable. And we challenge you to use this process to do the same at your organization. All right, so there's our video on trust that our team put together. And uh, it was a really interesting process to go through and scrape through the data from over 3,000 survey results to understand what the drivers of trust were. And for us, it were things that we want to uh, prioritize, such as engaging in courageous conversations in the moment, showing how decisions are made and how actions are taken, uh, treating stakeholders fairly and well, which are connected but very different uh, sentiments or concepts, rather, um, continuing to adapt our services to earn the right to lead in our industry, and even things like fair pay for fair work or just general table stakes, ESG reporting topics. These are all things that, that drive trust in different ways for our brand at PwC. So these disclosures, these new public disclosures really augment our existing ESG reporting. Uh, they're behavioral based and they reflect sentiment. So it's different about how a firm, our firm in particular, is progressing against uh, expectations. So we have new indexes like an employee trust index. Uh, the sentiment on the gap between being treated fairly versus well, and our speak up index around our culture and our ethics. So there are, of course, other table stakes KPIs. You can see them there. Um, we've also set five-year targets to make sure we're moving the needle and holding ourselves accountable. And we'll be reporting out on this twice a year. Oh, I want to play that. Yay, OK. So for our net zero by 2030 commitment, uh, I know we're all familiar with net zero. We talk a lot about it in our in our committee and as part of our goals as the uh, Environmental Sustainability Committee to support the greenhouse gas reduction plan for the city of Sault Ste. Marie. So 
This is um, something I, I do daily in my work at PwC is to support and implement the uh, goals towards our net zero by 2030 commitment. In September of 2020, PwC announced a worldwide commitment to reach our net zero GHG emissions by 2030. Uh, this net zero commitment is underpinned by a science-based target in line with a 1.5 degree scenario to prevent the worst impacts of climate change as set out in the Paris Agreement. In July of 2021, our emission reduction targets were independently validated by the science-based targets initiative. So what does this all really mean? Uh, you can see on the right there, that little box of the different pillars in which we're working on uh, to affect this commitment. Uh, we work with our clients to support their efforts to make a net zero future a reality for all. So we're building on existing work we have in our consulting and advisory practices for sustainability and net zero transformation, first of all. Um, for what we're doing as a firm ourselves, we will reduce our absolute emissions 50% in scope two and scope one. And this primarily for us is our buildings, heating and cooling. So this is off a 2019 baseline we are halving this by 2030. We're also halving our business travel emissions. Uh, so for us, primarily, you can imagine air travel uh, takes the most of that as, as we're flying and seeing our clients all over Canada. Um, in addition, we're accelerating the transition to 100% renewable electricity. And to mitigate our impacts today, uh, we'll continue to offset the remainder of our emissions that we uh, cannot eliminate currently through high quality carbon removal credits. We also have a supplier based target here. So um, we will engage with our key suppliers and encourage and support them to achieve net zero. Um, we commit that 50% of our global purchase goods and services supplier by emissions will have set their own science-based targets to reduce their own climate impacts by 2025. So we start to see a little bit of um, question about who are we choosing to work with in our supply chain and how responsible are they in terms of their commitments? And then you start getting a support for um, supporting your vendors being net zero, and then it affects your scope three emissions because they have net zero targets in place. And finally, uh, at PwC, we will continue with our longstanding program of research and collaboration uh, with business, policymakers, and NGOs to accelerate the transition to a net zero economy. So I wanted to play this newly updated video from our global chairman, uh, Bob Moritz, on our progress in our net zero commitment. To solve the climate crisis, every one of us has a role to play. As a reflection of our strategy to build trust with stakeholders and deliver sustained outcomes, we're committed to leading by example. In 2020, we made a commitment to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. There are five things I'm particularly proud of. First, our climate targets were independently validated as being in line with a 1.5 degree scenario. Importantly, our climate targets cover emissions across our whole value chain, including both direct and indirect emissions across scope one, two, as well as three. Second, recognizing that our commitment is going to take an effort across our whole business, we now have a net zero leader in each country in which we operate around the world to drive local execution. And we've committed to have the carbon emissions associated with delivering our services by 2030. Third, we are contributing to the transition to net zero around the world. For example, we're a proud member of the UN's race to zero and the business ambition for 1.5 degrees. Specifically, we've joined the largest public-private coalition to expand the market for high integrity carbon credits as well as protect tropical forests. And we've also committed to accelerate the supply and use of sustainable aviation fuel. Fourth, we continue to support the development of globally aligned ESG reporting standards by collaborating with standard setters and organizations like the World Economic Forum. We've become a founding member of the Net Zero Financial Service Providers Alliance 
which means that we'll report on how our audit services are consistent with broader net zero goals. And finally, fifth, we're upskilling all of our people on the importance and relevance of climate, ESG, and all of the related issues. And we're supporting our clients as they develop and implement concrete net zero plans and embed ESG across the entirety of their organizations. And as a community of solvers, we are uniquely positioned to bring the right combination of people, capabilities, and technology together to support the worldwide focus on the net zero transition. Some more links there in the in the deck that you can go and find some additional information on net zero. Um, I think what I like about uh, the focus of net zero at PwC is they really are um, digitally enabled, human led, tech powered. So we're all encouraged to um, understand this data very deeply, to understand and model out the impacts of all the decisions that we're making. We're making some um, investments right now in not only our people, but in technologies that help us consider our carbon footprint and the choices we make on our, our mobility. All right, so finally, I want to talk to you about another program that uh, our team um, drives, and that's our New World New Skills program. So. Um, with 30% of jobs at risk of automation by 2030, it's become increasingly apparent that one of Canada's most pressing challenges is the growing mismatch between the skills people have and the skills that are needed for the digital world. And some groups are especially at risk. So women, older workers, people living in marginalized communities, those who experience systemic inequity are given less opportunity to learn new skills. And the biggest barrier is someone's level of education. So that's why PwC Canada has committed $150 million through 2022 to upskill our 8,000 people to be future ready and to share their knowledge to support their communities. Um, to contribute, our goal is to reach 2 million people and not-for-profit organizations across Canada through 2025 with a focus on digital understanding, workforce capability, and digital inclusion. So I'm proud to say that we are just shy now of the 1 million uh, people in MPO mark. And so the next uh, three years will be important for us to reaching the next 1 million. Um, our goal to upskill 2 million people is focused on three societal impact streams. Uh, the first one is matching our people with not-for-profit boards and empowering them to upskill others. Um, there's a critical need for upskilling board of directors and management teams in the not-for-profit sector. And so by matching our people to MPO boards and empowering them to upskill others, we're helping to bridge this gap, which is shown to have significant socioeconomic impact for these organizations, making them more efficient at delivering their services. Uh, second, we are empowering our volunteers to share their knowledge. So we've got, as an example, an open source digital literacy curriculum program. So it allows other people to share uh, their knowledge in areas like data analytics, automation, and artificial intelligence so that other people are better positioned to help solve key issues facing society now and in the future. And thirdly, we are undertaking large scale pro bono projects that have scalable impacts. So this will ensure people in communities across Canada have access to practical solutions to their challenges uh, and in an environment that helps them learn and develop. So hopefully I didn't take up too much time. It looks like we still have some time on the agenda for Emily's updates, so wonderful. But uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Whoa, <laughs> there's a lot there. There's a lot there. Wow. Um, questions. We could have a great discussion about that. I think anyways, so what, what, what you, what you and PWC are doing, working together. This is, it's, it's a lot there. There's a lot of depth to it. Go ahead. Anybody got questions? I have a quick question. Um, I'll just echo Donna, Jamie. Wow. Um, 
I know you talked about the upskilling. Um, can you speak at all just on the climate change? Uh, what what type of upskilling is happening with regards to your your team on the climate change front? Yeah, so we have a whole practice in sustainability and climate change, and we continue to build that out and add more people. Um, we've got a, a program called Vantage, and it has these online courses that are mandatory and encouraged on ESG. So they're already built either by our Canadian LD team or our global LD teams. And so it's, again, open access, open curriculum for people to upskill themselves on ESG issues net zero issues, data analytics, any, anything you can imagine. Uh, right now we're doing uh, mandatory four seasons of reconciliation training. So there are components of different types of training that are, are uh, encouraged or mandatory. So yeah, that's a little bit of the upskilling that we're doing on, on ESG specifically. Um, we also have a, a a digital accelerator program. So people who are interested in analytics and learning tools for analytics will will get will volunteer to go into this program and become one of our digital accelerators that help upskill others in our organization. So that's a really cool program. Um, I learned uh, all tricks. I don't know if you've heard of that. A really smart data tool. So I used to do everything via spreadsheets, and now I can just half quarter of the time, pop it in a Altrix workflow and spit out what I need. So I, I love it. <laughs> it's great. We work with very large data sets now. So, so it's uh, helpful. Thanks, Jamie. Yeah, sure. Pedro. Hi, Jamie. I really, thanks for the presentation. It was really great. I appreciated the part on trust. I thought it was very interesting. Um, also, but my question was about uh, at one in your second video, it mentioned sustainable jet fuel production. Can you talk a little bit more about that? How do you sustainably um, get uh, jet fuel? Yeah, basically what they're talking about is uh, biofuel or like a, a bio kerosene, I think, for sustainable aviation fuel. You'd be able to see if you Google uh, PwC plus SAF, uh, you know, the Netherlands. PwC Netherlands has reached an agreement with one of the um flight providers that they'll exclusively fly with them because they are doing sustainable aviation fuel now so um yeah basically it's it's a biofuel for planes and there's no additional infrastructure needed to switch from a traditional jet fuel to a biofuel for aviation so that's uh, part of a quick win in the life cycle of emissions when it comes to SAFs and so I think like when we talked about months ago here that there's an excess of biomass here in our region, it got me thinking about this whole issue about travel and SAFs, and I don't know if that's a possibility for us or not, but um, this is where we see the travel industry going. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, there's a, I know it's a, a very big subject with how we lose land use and crop use and agricultural yeah. use versus uh, versus harvesting and yes those solutions are really interesting so i understand what what it means now yeah thank you yeah sure mark mark it's you that it, i'm i want to remember properly but it, you're the you're the member of our committee who has a specific interest in biofuel or am i getting you am i not remembering properly one of you one of you does i know that for sure I think it was brought up as one of the topics uh, when we were brainstorming ideas for project priorities. I, I, I used the wrong terminology. I meant biomass, like a use for, was it, wasn't it? It wasn't you, Mark? Okay. I'm not, it was not. Uh, Fred. It yeah, was Fred. It was, okay. Was, okay. Yeah, it was me related to the local forestry, forest biomass availability. Okay. Um, I've never heard this term upskilling before. That's a new one for me. Um, interesting. Um, anyone else with questions for Jamie? Yeah, yeah. I have a full time. Uh, I just, I was curious about the, uh, when you talk net zero 2030, uh, and specifically with the supply chain, do you, um, how do you encourage or support or, I guess not really tell your suppliers about uh, to go net zero um, 
you know, how do you work around that? And especially in situations now where, you know, in, in the industry that I'm in, we face challenges of getting supplies, period, let alone telling them to do it, you know, with less carbon intensive methods. So. Yeah, that's and it's an interesting question. Right now, that's an engagement goal, right? We want to engage our suppliers to set their own targets. Now, when we look at by emissions, the process we do is we look at how much are we spending on suppliers and in which categories, right? So some categories are our IT hardware or our IT software is a different category and they have different emission factors associated with them. So we categorize our suppliers, figure out how much we spend in them, and then we figure out the emissions, right? And then we're starting to rank by emissions. And we can see that IT software for us is actually quite high, like top three. So then we think about who are suppliers and software. Microsoft's a great one, right? Google's another. Microsoft came out with a net negative goal, right? So they're already there. So I think like depending on what category you're in uh, and where like, again, where those industries are going, then that provides some already some momentum that's happening without you having to say anything. Uh, to encourage that those goals, right? So it's really, in my team, always starts with the analysis first, right? And then you, you go after kind of the low-hanging fruit and take those wins where you can and build out a strategy for the rest of it. So that's kind of the approach. Sorry, that answers the question, Mark. It's not that. Yeah, no, is that, so is that, built, is that built right into your purchasing model? Um, when you go to purchase or buy things, it's, it's you know, that's part of the company, the ranking of, of who and why you buy from certain people? I can't exactly answer that question at this moment on, on this call, but I will say that I've certainly seen it in contracts coming back to us. Pedro, I think you wanted to jump in too. <laughs> yeah, no, I was just, I was just thinking that with, you know, with with Jamie's experience and and when she looks at our city, the city as a as an organization, do you think it would be possible to have net zero by twenty thirty? I mean, I know the target is twenty fifty, and it's a loaded question, but <laughs> well, hear. for I think there's a difference between what we're doing at PwC because we're independently validated by the science-based target initiative. I don't think that the um, the validation is the same scope or, or within the purview or whatever the city is wanting to do. I think the methodology is a little bit different. I think we have to be careful on what we're communicating as net zero. So under our boundaries, net zero by 2030 means we're halving our emissions by 2030. Uh, perhaps like um, the city's GHG reduction plan and net zero means a little bit different for a percentage, right? So depending on, I'd have to look at see, is it, could they meet half of emissions? Like that would require a little bit of digging into. I think the initial goal, Emily, can you keep me honest? I want to say 10% mm -hmm. of corporations emissions, right? By 2030. Yeah. No, pardon me, 2050. 10% by 2030? 2030, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly as a committee where I, I would like to spend more time digging into and understanding um, specifically what is the pathway to 10% by 2030. Thank you. I'm not, I'm not sure we, we've dug into those gritty details just quite yet. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. That's why I asked, but I, I know we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyone else with other questions for Jamie? Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, there was a lot of information in there. Um, and uh, congratulations to your company for that. Like it's expansive, it's global. It's really so interesting. Um, and effective, obviously. Emily, take us home. Okay. Um, all right. So I thanks again, Jamie. That was super, super enlightening. Um, I'm going to jump in here into the project update for our Environmental Sustainability Committee uh, Project Priorities Working Group for 2022. So as a reminder, there were three projects that the committee wanted to focus on. The first one related to active transportation. And I'd like to say that the, the working group has made some excellent progress on a survey 
uh, for uh, sharing with the community, as well as the re um, the revamping, if you will, of our corporate webpage for active transportation, which as it currently stands is extremely lean. So we've got some really great feedback from the working group. Um, all of this has actually gone and been shared with our planning department. And I'm very pleased to announce that they've actually provided us with some feedback. They're going to take the survey that we created and incorporate it into the active transportation master plan stakeholder consultations, which is I think a good, a good use of resources as opposed to doing two separate surveys. And I'm actually happy to announce that um, the city lead on the active transportation master plan from our planning department, Steve Turco, will be joining us at our meeting on September 15th to seek further feedback on the active transportation master plan, the development of the plan, stakeholder consultations, and talk a little bit more about next steps on that. So that is underway. He'll also speak to some of the things that we didn't address too, too much in the web page, including the development of a trail systems map, which I know he has some more information on as well. So stay tuned on that. Um, with regards to project number two, the stormwater art, um, I have been advised by our manager of recreation and culture that we will be, I will be receiving the designs um, in the next day or so. And I'd actually like to extend an invitation to committee members to review some of the designs as well that will be painted um, onto the patch basins. So keep your eyes peeled for the, uh, the email and we'll be, we'll be ranking those. And the last project uh, is complete, which was the revamping of the terms of reference to the Green Initiatives Fund uh, as it pertains to uh, the additional three pillars. And that was approved by council and is already underway. I have my staff update next and we've got four minutes. So if there aren't any questions on that, I'm gonna just jump on in. Can everybody see my screen? Okay. Okay, so a couple of quick updates. Um, the, the city's uh, annual energy and emissions reporting to the province has been submitted and has been posted to the city's webpage as per the regulations, so that's done. Um, a couple of other updates on the go here. Um, you may have seen earlier this week at council that the single use plastics ban bylaw has um, been approved. And I can share more details on that, uh, perhaps at another meeting when we have a little bit more time. Um, we are underway at exploring how we can look for funding as well as update our energy audits, which are very old. They were done back in 2010. And we'd like to undertake a series of deep carbon retrofits um, audits rather on um, all city facilities, but for sure our big emitters. So more details to come on that uh, soon. Um, we are in the process of finalizing the uh, selection of a bidder for our community retrofit program feasibility study. So again, I'll hopefully have more um, insight on that at our next meeting. And um, the official plan that is in the process of being updated and finalized was actually reviewed from a climate lens by the Climate Risk Institute. A lot of excellent feedback was provided to the city on this. Um, and I will be meeting with our planning department to uh, discuss that in more detail, some tweaks um, regarding not only mitigation, but also resiliency and adaptation. Um, I have received direction from council to develop a community EV charging infrastructure plan. Um, so I will be sharing progress on that with the committee. We've got a couple new retrofits on the go, including um, the a recommissioning project at our GFL ice plant. We've applied for funding for that from the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. Um, and uh, more details to come. Hopefully we're successful on that. And we also have an opportunity to update uh, some more lighting at our public works garage. Um, so some decent energy savings there, uh, as well as an incentive um, from the province. And we'll be looking at replacing another piece of equipment at um, our seniors drop-in, which will reduce our emissions um, as well. And we're working on updating our corporate emissions uh, update for 2021. And this per our pledge to the race to zero is due by the end of Q3 and will be shared with the committee. So, so far, I wanna say we're on track with that. Fingers crossed we can stick to it. 
Um, so that's it for the updates. A lot of really good shared resources to share. Um, for those who haven't been checking those out, I encourage you to do so. And we've got a really nice inventory of almost 100 resources that have been shared by different committee members over the course of the year. Um, so really nice to see that. And this is also open to the public. Um, and last but not least, I just want to highlight a couple of things. You would have received an email from me earlier this week uh, regarding our September ESC meetings. Our, our normal meeting, which is scheduled for September 8th, has actually been transitioned into a one-hour special presentation. Um, we're pleased to have partnered with the city's planning department and we'll be hosting um, international urbanists, Mr. Brent Tadarian, as well as the city of Kingston, who will be speaking to us about uh, they're very innovative and outside of the box project regarding parking reform. And uh, Mr. Tadarian will also be sharing some best practices as it relates to urban sustainable development. He's worked with municipalities around the world, Oslo, Brisbane, Vancouver. Um, so I think it'll be an insightful presentation. City staff, including senior management, as well as mayor and council have all been invited. Um, so I'm hopeful that we'll have a good turnout from our city leadership for that. Um, so you can register uh, in this PowerPoint or you can reach out to me directly, but as uh, leaders on our environmental committee, I strongly encourage you to attend. Um, and so our regular ESC meeting will be quite short, but it will be taking place um, on September 15th. Um, so if anyone has any trouble with that date, please let me know. I'll send out a follow-up email, but I know I've inundated your inboxes quite a bit this week, um, just to make sure that everything works for everyone. Um, next month, um, as well as some more details about attending meetings in person. Um, so with that, I'm going to end. I think we're at probably 5, oh, 531. Um, so I'll stop sharing my screen. I know that was pretty rapid. Um, if there's any quick questions, happy to answer them. Anyone with questions on uh, Emily's uh, reports? Okay. Nothing for me. A lot of great information, Emily. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, Fred. Um, all right. Let's continue to fight the good fight, all of us. And uh, we will see you in see you in September. Yeah. Um, okay. Ciao. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Thanks Donna. Everybody. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.